Uh, today we're starting a new series of messages that Pastor Joel talked about. It's called uh, Losing My Lame Religion. We're going to look at the last book of the Old Testament. If you've been around Journey this year, you know we've been going through really the Bible in, in a unique way called the story. And the first part of the year, uh, January through June, we kind of focused on the Old Testament part. This summer we've taken a break. We've looked at the one-chapter books in the Bible. We've looked at some of the prophetic messages in the Bible. And this weekend... Uh, I, I thought it would be really cool to, before we launch in the month of September back into the New Testament part of the story to look at the last book of the Old Testament because this is kind of God's last revealed word to his people before the coming of Jesus Christ. And I don't know if you've ever done a, a study on the book of Malachi. And by the way, it's pronounced Malachi. I had one little boy in camp several years ago and he said, I think I'm going to read the book of Malachi. <laughs> and I said, oh, the Italian prophet. Yes, I know him. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's, it's not Malachi, it's Malachi, and it's not Malachi, okay? It's Malachi, and he is the last writing Old Testament prophet. Now, we don't know much about this guy. Uh, there's not a lot of personal information about him like some of the other prophets uh, have written about themselves, but we do know one thing. He had a clear message to deliver to God's people, and these are the people of God who have returned to the land of Israel. And they're literally trying to rebuild their lives after being decimated by years of living in exile. And that message, simply put, was this. God deserves our very best. Everybody say that with me right now. God deserves our very best. A woman called up the Butterball Turkey Company's consumer hotline. And she asked about the advisability of cooking a turkey that had been in her freezer for 23 years. The customer service representative told her it would be okay to eat if the freezer had maintained a below zero temperature the entire time, which would be no small feat in itself. But even so, the representative said, the flavor would have deteriorated so much that it wouldn't taste very good. And the caller said, oh, that's what I thought. I'll just give it to my church. About 430 years before the birth of Jesus Christ, a little-known prophet, but courageous prophet named Malachi told God's people, in effect, don't bother bringing 23-year-old turkeys to offer to the Lord. Don't waste your time or God's. Bring your best. Why? Because God deserves our very best. Now, I want us to look at Malachi chapter 1. If you have your Bibles, you want to go ahead and turn to Malachi chapter 1. Lengthy passage we're going to read. I'm going to read straight through it, and then we'll jump into this a little bit more. We're going to begin in verse 6 of Malachi chapter 1. Malachi chapter 1 verse 6 says, A son honors his father and a slave his master. If I'm a father, where's the honor due me? If I'm a master, where's the respect due me, says the Lord Almighty. It is you, priest, who show contempt for my name. But you ask, how have we shown contempt for your name? By offering defiled food on my altar. But you ask, how have we defiled you? By the way, every writer in the Bible has their own personality and their own literary writing style. They have their own unique way of writing. And one of the things you're going to see if you read the book of Malachi is one of his favorite literary techniques is he likes to ask questions and then answer them. And so here, he's already in the first chapter, how have, we shown, how have we shown contempt for your name? By offering defiled food on my altar. But you ask, how have we defiled you? He'd, he'll do that throughout these four chapters. By saying that the Lord's table is contemptible, he answers. When you offer blind animals for sacrifice, is that not wrong? When you sacrifice lame or diseased animals, is that not wrong? Try offering them to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you, says the Lord Almighty? Now plead with God to be gracious to us with such offerings from your hands. Will he accept you, says the Lord Almighty? Oh, that one of you would shut the temple doors so that you would not light useless fires on my altar. I am not pleased with you, says the Lord Almighty, and I will accept no offering from your hands. My name will be great among the nations from where the sun rises to where it sets. In every place, incense and pure offerings will be brought to me because my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord Almighty. But you profane it by saying the Lord's table is defiled and its food is contemptible. And you say, what a burden. And you sniff at it contemptuously, says the Lord Almighty. When you bring injured, lame or diseased animals and then offer them as sacrifices, should I accept them from your hands, says the Lord? 
Cursed is the cheat who has an acceptable male in his flock and vows to give it, but then sacrifices a blemished animal to the Lord. For I am a great king, says the Lord Almighty, and my name is to be feared among the nations. Now, without burying you in a whole lot of detail about the background and the circumstances that prompted the writing of this book, all you need to know for the purpose of this series over the next four weeks is that the prophet Malachi was commissioned by God with one specific goal in mind, and that goal was to reestablish the standards of excellence amongst God's people. That was his goal, to reestablish the standards of excellence amongst God's people. Or, as I have termed it for the purposes of this series, he's telling people to lose their lame religion. From here on out, if anybody ever asks you what the book of Malachi is about, and it could happen this week at the water cooler at your work. You never know about that. <laughs> or it could come at a crucial moment in a game of Jeopardy. Someone could say to you, do you know what the book of Malachi is about? You could say to your friend at the water cooler or to Alex Trebek with great confidence. Why, of course I do. It's about reestablishing the standards of excellence amongst God's people. I'll take Al Alex, I'll take uh, Malachi for a thousand. The man who, consider, who is considered the father of modern business management. His name is, is Peter Drucker. And if you've read any kind of business uh, uh, consultation books over the past two or three decades, you've probably run across this guy's name. He once said this. He said, one of the most important functions of leadership in any organization is to uphold standards of excellence for the simple reason that without consistent promptings, Excellence and excellent standards will always drift south. If you have anything to do in a supervisory or management position in an institution or organization where you work, you know how true that is. And that is precisely what had begun to happen to the attitudes and behaviors and relationships among God's people during the prophet Malachi's day. Everything from their approach to worship that we've just read about to their keeping of their marriage covenants that we're going to study next week to how they handle their money, which we'll talk about in a couple weeks, to their understanding and submitting to moral authority in their life was drifting further and further away from the standards revealed by God. And so God appointed this straight-talking prophet named Malachi to come and reestablish his standards of excellence and challenge the people to live up to them. Here's a statement I heard years ago, and, and it has stayed with me in some form or another since that time. Sometimes it has been written in the corporate DNA uh, of places where I've worked, but regardless whether it's written somewhere or not, it's a principle that has been written on my soul since I heard it. And here it is. And I want you to say it out loud with me. Let's say it out loud. Excellence honors God and inspires people. Say it one more time. Excellence honors God and inspires people. Why, well, why is that so important? Why do we make such a big deal out of giving God our best? Well, let me try to unpack this for you theologically. I think the root of our desire to present excellence to God is because of his consistent excellence in giving to us. What am I talking about? Well, let me put it to you like this. Would you agree that by any standard of measurement, God did a good job when he created the heavens and the earth? Spend some time strolling along a beach particularly at sunrise or sunset. Walk through a forest of pine trees that blanket a mountainside. Lay on your back at night outside and try to count some stars. Give God a grade. How'd he do? Mediocre? Kind of meh? Average? Pretty good? Look at the wonder of the human body. Men and women with bodies and minds, spirits and souls, marvelously complex creatures with physical, intellectual, emotional, and spiritual capabilities that boggle the imagination. I mean, you got to give God an excellent for that one, don't you? Little boy asked his mom, he said, Mom, is it true that God really created people, the original people from nothing but dust? Mom said, yeah, it's exactly right. He said, and is it true, Mom, that when we die, we're going to return to dust? She said, yes, it is. Why are you asking that? He said, I just looked under my bed, and somebody's either coming or going. <laughs> Sounds like there's not excellent housekeeping going on there. Would you agree with that? From a handful of dust, God began humanity. And then think about how these magnificent creatures that have been formed 
from dust, these magnificent creatures that God created and they balled up their puny little fist and they rebelled against this very God that created them very, very early on in the story. Did God stomp them out for their incredible insurrection? No, he demonstrated excellent forbearance and excellent patience with them, covering their nakedness and their shame and promising them a coming once for all deliverer. And as the story unfolds throughout the pages of the Old Testament scriptures, he keeps loving and working with and teaching these rebellious creatures century after century. And the greatest sacrifice that God ever asked, that God ever asked for from his people was an animal without defect an unblemished lamb. He told them through Moses, when you come to worship me, you bring a lamb to the temple as a worship offering. And not just any lamb. You bring the blue ribbon lamb. You bring the one that would bring the most money at the marketplace. You make me an excellent worship offering when you bring one. Now for a short period of time, God's people honored that standard. But in Malachi's day, not so much. The people begrudgingly walked around their herds and their flocks, and instead of bringing their best lamb to God, do you know what they were looking for? They were looking for the lame lambs. They were looking for the ones leaning up against the fence, ready to keel over and die. One that was blemished with no market value. And they were saying, this is one I don't need. That one's not worth much. I'll give that one to God. Friends, it was the equivalent of giving God a 23-year-old freezer burn turkey. And Malachi was sent by God to tell the people your offerings are of no value to you and consequently they're of no value to God. Your sacrifice is stink, he says. In fact, you're better off not to bring an offering. You're better off to shut the temple door and put the fire out on the altar than to offer God less than your best. God doesn't want your leftovers. He's not interested in your scraps. He demands and deserves your best lambs. You say, why? Because God knew one day he was going to give his best lamb. The lamb that would be born through Mary. The one that had been prophesied for centuries. The lamb that would take away the sins of the world. And every lamb that was sacrificed in the Old Testament was a foreshadowing of that perfect lamb which was to come. And when it came time for Jesus, the lamb of God, to pay the price for your sin and my sin... He died an excellent death. Have you ever thought of it that way? Jesus Christ died an excellent death for you. He, he, he carried his own cross as far as he humanly could. He forgave those who pounded the spikes into his hands and his feet. He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He was, as he was literally suspended between heaven and earth on a cross, he made practical arrangements for his mother to be taken care of, while at the same time he was making redemptive arrangements for all of us to be taken care of. Within moments of his final breath, he made room for one more sinner in his kingdom, the thief hanging on the cross beside him. And with his final breath, he cried out, it is finished. Jesus died an excellent death for our sins. And then he pulled off a most excellent resurrection. So sudden and swift was his triumph over the grave that the burial wrappings that encased his body were completely undisturbed. They looked like they'd been deflated because death had been defeated. And then his disciples watched as he took the express elevator back home to his father. It was an excellent ascension. And then he sent his excellent spirit so that each of his followers would become carriers of his power and presence. What an excellent idea the gift of the Holy Spirit is. And then he launched an excellent dynamic organism called the church, which would express his love to a love-starved world throughout the generations and give his followers a family of faith to belong to and a mission to commit their lives to. And the scriptures tell us that even now, he's preparing an excellent home for all of us who put our faith and trust in him. To paraphrase the apostle Paul's words in 2 Corinthians 4, 17, he says, our light and momentary troubles are not worth comparing to the eternal glory waiting for us. All I'm saying is this, friends, when you begin to honestly assess the divine activity of God on our behalf, you can understand why the book of Revelation says that one day when all this is wrapped up, one day as we look back on the panoramic sweep of God's divine activity for all of us, we're going to join the hallelujah chorus of angels and we're going to stand before the throne of God and say, holy, 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 worthy, 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 excellent, excellent, excellent. Now back to Malachi chapter 1. The prophet simply raises the question, how should a human being respond to the excellent activities of God 
on our behalf? With what kind of worship offering? What kind of lamb do you bring such an excellent God? And Malachi the prophet would say, here's a clue. The one leaning against the fence wheezing. The lame one. Don't bring that one. Bring the best that you got to the one who gave his best for you. Why? Because excellence honors God and inspires people. So today, I want to I want to make the case for excellence. Now, here's what I know. I know that doing things with excellence has fallen out of favor with some in certain leadership circles. They talk about the danger of making excellence an idol, and it certainly can be. Excellence is not our ultimate goal. Glorifying God and seeing people's lives changed by the power of God is our ultimate goal. If we want people to notice our flawless performances or to be impressed with us in any way, our heart's in the wrong place. Excellence merely describes the way we try to achieve the goal. So before I give you some observations on what pursuing excellence is, let me tell you what pursuing excellence is not. First of all, pursuing excellence is not the same thing as pursuing perfectionism. People who are pursuing perfectionism are generally demanding, judgmental, cranky, joyless, difficult to be around people. Their standard of perfection is rarely, if ever, met, and they have a way of emitting negativity into almost any environment. Eventually, a perfectionistic personality will become paralyzed by the pressure to perform, and they can become depressed and depressing to be around. It's not pursuing perfectionism. Secondly, pursuing excellence is not an excuse to become a workaholic. It's not an excuse to become a workaholic. Workaholics have destructive patterns of overwork that never allows them to turn it off. Now, you would think that someone that works all the time would be people who achieve excellence, and you would be wrong. Workaholics are always engaged in their work at 50 to 60 to 70 percent. They're always engaged. They never turn it off. But if you never turn it off, you can never turn it on to maximum potential because you don't have the capacity. They work all the time, and they never truly rest and recover and allow their creative best to emerge. God wired us to live in a rhythm of work and rest to be at our best. And when we ignore that pattern, we will never achieve excellence. Pursuing excellence is not about seeking approval. People with a disease to please, like myself, we can get caught up in attaching our self-worth to how others rate our performance. When others tell us we're doing well, we can end up sounding like actress Sally Field several years ago when she got her second Oscar. She gushed, you like me. You really, really like me. And that's a needy and revealing statement. There's a great danger in living for the approval of others. Many dark things emerge within us when we crave the crowd's approval. Beware. Pursuing excellence is not just a motto that you put on a wall. Here's what I've seen in a lot of leadership circles. A lot of leaders, a lot of managers say, we're going to do things with excellence, and that's one of our core values. And see right there, we've got it on the wall. We've got it in our employee handbook. We do things with excellence. Friends, excellence is not a value that can be imposed from the top. It can only be modeled from the top. When you as a key leader of a team are personally committed to making your contribution with excellence, others are more likely to follow your clue. Because excellence is not a phrase you put on the wall. It's about what's happening down the hall. Pursuing excellence is not the same thing as being extravagant. It's not the same thing as being extravagant. When you make a commitment to excellence, people will invariably misunderstand your mission, and they'll misjudge your motives, and they will interpret your commitment as arrogance. The mediocre masses love to say, you're too into performance. It's just all about the show for you. Listen to me. Excellence is not extravagantly trying to live up to the world's standards. Excellence is exceptionally trying to uphold God's standards. So what does excellent mean? What does excellence mean from a biblical point of view? Well, here's some quick observations. Let me give these to you very quickly. First of all, I would say this. Excellence takes time. Excellence takes time time. It's been said that excellence is not a one-time act. It is a habit. It's more of an attitude than a skill, and to develop excellence in any area takes time. My mother is an excellent cook. I know many people think their mother is the best cook in the world, but mine actually is. <laughs> and I have some empirical objective data to verify that. 
She's cooked in hospitals. She's cooked in public schools. She's cooked in restaurants. And when she retired, many civic organizations and private individuals sought to hire her to prepare meals for them because they know in that area of northern Kentucky, Marjorie Hampton's cooking is as good as it gets. So I asked my mother one time, I said, Mom, tell me, in your opinion, what's the difference between a good cook and a bad cook? She said, about 15 minutes. I said, what's the difference between a good cook and an excellent cook? She said, about five minutes. Excellence requires time in planning, preparation, and presentation. You cannot take shortcuts and achieve excellence. Someone has pointed out that the only place success comes before sweat is in the dictionary. (laughs) Excellence requires time. A few years back, there was an author named Malcolm Gladwell. And Gladwell published a book titled Outliers, The Story of Success. That's the name of the book. He studied successful athletes. He studied in depth Bill Gates, founder of Microsoft. He studied the Beatles and many other wildly successful people. And here's what he learned. He learned there are some common themes in each of them. And one of them was what he called the 10,000 hour rule. Fascinating, which basically says the key to success, the key to being excellent in any field is to a large extent a matter of practicing a specific task for a total of around 10,000 hours. Think about that. And that rule has held up in subsequent research in the lives of inventors and artists and athletes and educators. Excellence takes time. Secondly, excellence is evidenced in the little things. Excellence is evidenced in little things. I'm a golfer, and if you like golf, you've probably watched the Masters Golf Tournament held at Augusta National Golf Course. It's one of the most beautiful golf courses in the world. I guarantee you, anybody here that loves golf, if you were to ask the average golfer, if you knew you could get on any course in the world, public or private, what course would you want to get on? 99% of them would say, Augusta National. I'd like to play that course. I guarantee it. The directors and administration of Augusta National have a commitment to excellence. The landscape is spectacular. The grounds are immaculate. I've read that on occasion that tournament officials will rewrap some of the candy so that concession stands in green paper so that if someone litters, the trash won't be visible on television. People go there and say there's a beauty that's almost surreal about the place. And when the Masters is held there, they advertise it like this. The Masters, a tradition unlike any other. Why? Because they give attention to the little details. Here's how Jesus said in Luke 16, 10. Read this out loud with me. He who is faithful in a very little thing is faithful also in much. Excellence, excellence is evidenced in the little things. Thirdly, excellence requires daily diligence. If you've ever built a new house, Melinda and I, several years ago, we built a house. And your brand spanking new house, I mean, uh, everything's painted, everything's fresh. The flowers are beautiful. The landscape is excellent. And all those things can be done with excellence. But you step back and you admire it and you say, that that's a beautiful thing. But you know what you find out? It's not long before your, your work begins to deteriorate. And those walls that were so fresh, they'll need to be repainted. And the grass has to be cut regularly. And the weeds have to be pulled from the flower beds. You see, you can't relax for long. If your home is going to maintain a level of excellence, you must be diligently You must uh, give diligence daily. It must be ongoing. The same is true of maintaining a standard of excellence in your work, your family, your school, or your church. Programs and projects may begin with excellence, but it takes daily diligence to maintain that standard. Now, mistakes are going to happen. You know that. I kind of write down some things that occur to me occasionally, and I just had a new thought occur to me occasionally. At least it was new to me, and so I wrote it down like this. Regardless of how promising something looks, stupidity is ready to break out at any given moment. Isn't that true? (laughs) Regardless of how well things are going, regardless of how promising something looks, stupidity is always ready to break out at any given moment. When it does, it's the leader's job to constantly hold people accountable and remind them why we strive for excellence in the first place, because excellence honors God and inspires people. I love this quote from John Gardner. John Gardner said, some people have greatness thrust upon them. Very few have excellence thrust upon them. Wow, that's such a good statement. Very few have excellence thrust upon them. They achieve it. They do not achieve it unwittingly by doing what comes naturally, and they don't stumble into it in the course of amusing themselves. All excellence involves discipline and tenacity of purpose. Now, as we wrap up, 
I want to give you some practical takeaways. Let me give you some, what, what I call some excellent advice on establishing excellence. All right? Number one, clearly defined expectations are the beginning of excellence. Clearly defined expectations are the beginning of excellence. Often your first effort at a new task becomes the standard for later expectations. If you're going to school this week, if you're starting back to school, maybe it's a, a, just a elementary school, high school, particularly those that are going to college. Let me say this to you. If you make all A's in your first semester, you've established a standard. You won't be very satisfied with B's next semester, nor will your parents be. However, if you make straight C's the first semester, B's in the spring look pretty good, don't they? <laughs> if you start teaching a, a group, if you start teaching a Bible study, you'll probably study harder the first week than any other week. Now, if you spend minutes preparing and somehow survive, even though the lesson wasn't great, you'll realize you can get by with 15 minutes of prep time, and you'll be tempted to do that every week from then on. But if you study a few hours that first week, people will be able to tell you worked hard, you put time into it, and everyone, including you, will expect the same standard week after week. I was a, I was a C plus B minus student in high school. Maybe that surprises you that it was that high. I don't know. <laughs> but I was, a C, I was a C plus B minus student. Truthfully, I did not put much time into studying when I was in high school. I, I, had, I wanted to play basketball and I wanted to see my girlfriend as much as possible. And when I started college, honestly, I was scared I was going to flunk out. I was afraid I might flunk out of college. So from the outset, I started writing papers early. I read assignments before they were due. And guess what? In college, I was a B plus, A minus student. I even made the dean's list a few times. Not much, but a few times. I won an award for scoring the highest on the Bible college content test my, uh, my senior year. Friends, that would not have happened had I not changed my ex expectations early on. Determine the first time you try something, whether it's at school or at work or at church, that you're going to do it to the best of your ability. Employers and supervisors, let me say this to you. New employees need to be tactfully but clearly confronted the first time the standard of excellence is not achieved. They are more likely to step up their efforts when they realize the standard that is expected of them before they get into the habit of doing things haphazardly or sloppily. And if they start doing that, you have to do what my friend Barney says. Watch this. I say this calls for action and now nip it in the bud. Nip it in the bud. You got to nip it in the bud. Nip it in the bud. You got to nip it in the bud. Nip it in the bud. You got to nip it in the bud. Nip it in the bud. You got to nip it in the bud. Now, I admit that's not quite as cool as Pastor Matt and getting his panther on, okay? If you were here last weekend for that. How many of you knew who that was? Okay, very good. I had a young man on staff when we were talking about Andy Griffith and Barney, and he said, who's Barney Fifth? That's when I knew I was outdated, all right? Read with me Ecclesiastes 9.10. Let's read this out loud together. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Clearly defined expectations are the beginning of excellence. Secondly, evaluation is the key to maintaining excellence. Evaluation is the key to maintaining excellence. I learned a long time ago, you have to inspect what you expect. And if you don't, you're going to end up with some employees like this. Now, this comes from an HR website, and supposedly these are actual reports that supervisors have written about their employees in their evaluations, like this. His men would follow him anywhere, but only out of morbid curiosity. <laughs> this employee is really not so much of a has-been, but more of a definite won't be. <laughs> Works well when under constant supervision and cornered like a rat in a trap. <laughs> when she opens her mouth, it seems that it's only to change feet. This young lady has delusions of adequacy. 
He, one of my favorites. He sets low personal standards, then consistently fails to achieve them. <laughs> oh, I love that. This employee is depriving a village somewhere of an idiot. This employee should go far, and the sooner he starts, the better. Evaluations can sometimes be painful, but without honest and loving feedback, we rarely get better. I heard a preacher when I was off, he, he made this comment. I thought this was such a good statement. And, and we, we live here in the Sunshine State. We live around water parks. We live close to beaches, uh, you know, either coast. We, 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 a lot of us have swimming pools. And, and you've, been, you've been to a public beach, and you've been to a water park, and you've had this thought. When you see someone, where were their friends? You know what I'm saying? Yes. Who let them out of the house looking like that? <laughs> Where were their friends? You've watched, Amer you go, you've watched America's Got Talent. You, uh, their tryouts. You've watched American Idol. And you listen to those people. And you say, where are their friends? <laughs> everybody here, everybody on staff at Journey, we're evaluated annually. Every employee. I'm evaluated annually. The elders take some time, put together a form, and really spend an evening with me and just give me feedback. And the elders themselves evaluate themselves. They evaluate the elder team as a whole. They evaluate each man that's a part of the elder team. Because if you don't get honest feedback, you just do what you think's right, and we all have blind spots. Hey, I want you to look at these two scriptures. Proverbs 12, 15 says, a fool thinks he needs no advice, but a wise man listens to others. Proverbs 13, 17 says, reliable communication permits progress. You know what those two verses say? Those two verses say, if you, if you have no honest feedback loops in your life, you're a fool and you won't progress. That's what that says. So evaluation is the key to maintaining excellence. Thirdly, focus is the secret of ensuring excellence. Focus is the secret of ensuring excellence. You cannot do everything that needs to be done. Even in a church as large as this one, with so many ministries and so many serving opportunities and so many groups, we constantly have to say no to many good ideas. Because listen to me, if you say yes to everything, you're saying no to the one or two things that you do best. John Maxwell has a saying, you are most valuable where you add the most value. I mentioned Peter Drucker earlier, and, and here's one of his most famous quotes. Being efficient is not the same thing as being effective. And you say, what's the difference? Here's the difference. Efficiency is doing things right. Effectiveness is doing the right things. And you can be efficient and still dine as an organization. You can have a full calendar and lots of programs that generate a lot of activity. But hear me, activity is not the same thing as productivity. It's not, to say, it's, it's not enough to be well organized. You have to be well organized to do the right things. Focus is the secret of ensuring excellence. Look at what Paul wrote on this in Philippians 3.13. He says, no, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing. What's that one thing? Following Jesus Christ and forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. Number four. Number four, utilization of people's giftedness is the strategy for implementing excellence. Utilization of people's giftedness is the strategy for implementing excellence. If a task is to be done with excellence, it needs to be accomplished by the person most gifted to do it. God has given me a gift of communicating, a gift of preaching. But I want to tell you something right now. If I were put in charge of property and grounds, every flower here would die just like that. I have a brown thumb. I don't have a green thumb. If I was in charge of maintenance, our building would be in sad, sad shape. I, I've tried to be a handyman. You can ask Melinda. Honestly, I have, but it just ain't happening. It takes me so long to complete even the simplest of projects, and somebody who knows what they're doing would laugh at me if they saw uh, how I did things. Several years ago, several years ago, our family got our first computer. It was a big deal. We got this big, you know, desktop computer, and and. Our oldest daughter ran upstairs hysterically laughing one night. Anna came upstairs. She said, Dad, I fixed the sound on our computer. Now, let me rewind the story here. For about four months, we went without audio on our, on our computer. I mean, it's there one day. Next day, it's gone. I don't know what happened. I, I, I talked to some IT people on the staff at church. I asked them what they thought. I checked into replacing the sound card as if I could <laughs> and would know what one would look like. 
I complained about it constantly. And so Anna said, Dad, I fixed the sound. I said, how did you do it? She said, Dad, it was on mute. <laughs> Four months. I don't do much IT stuff around here. People need to do things in areas where they are gifted. Paul writes in Romans 12, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying or preaching, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it's serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it's to encourage, then give encouragement. If it's giving, give generously. If it's to lead, do it diligently. If it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully. In other words, if you do the things that you're gifted to do and you let others do the things that they're gifted to do, together you will achieve excellence. Now, here's one problem. <laughs> we just got to say this, right? Sometimes people believe they're gifted to do things when they're not. You know what I'm saying? I heard about a young man who believed he had the gift of singing, but he didn't. And nobody had told him. And he sang a solo at his church and he just bombed. I mean, it was so, it was bad. And after the service, most people tried to avoid him. Some people tried to express appreciation without lying, but there was one old man and there's always one old man who'll tell you the truth, right? <laughs> there's always one grumpy old guy who'll tell you the truth. He said, son, it's not your fault you can't sing a lick. You did your best. He said, but whoever invited you to sing ought to be fired. <laughs> early on, this true story, early on in my ministry, early on in my ministry, I was a preacher at a small church. I mean, a church of 30 or 40 people in the country in Kentucky. And there was a guy in our area. He would just show up uninvited and unannounced. And he would say, I'm here to sing today. He called himself the singing minister and he was neither. So... <laughs> But as a young preacher, I was put on the spot. I wanted to be nice to the guy, and so I let him sing once, and it was just what I thought. It wasn't good. And he came back several months later, and I didn't let him sing. And after the service was over, he came up to me. He said, Brother John, the Lord laid it on my heart to come here and sing this morning. And I said, he didn't lay it on my heart to call on you. <laughs> you know, you've got to fight fire with fire with these spiritual talking people. You know what I'm saying? All right, number five, and you're already in the mood for this one. You got it. A sense of humor is the requirement in striving for excellence. A sense of humor is the requirement in striving for excellence. I read a long time ago that God gave us, God gave us an imagination to dream about what we could be, and he gave us a sense of humor to console us for what we are. <laughs> I heard of a man who was new to the staff of a large church large and fast growing church. And it was, this church was known for its excellent worship services. And he was doing the baptisms at one service on a particular Sunday. And as can happen when you speak a lot in different environments, he got his wedding statement mixed up with his baptism statement. <laughs> so instead of saying the usual, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, he said to the person in the baptistry, I now pronounce you and he paused to figure a way out, and then he just said it, baptized, and put him right under. <laughs> True story. I was baptizing a guy several years ago, and back then when I used to baptize people, I'd raise my hand up like this, like I was swearing in the courtroom, okay? I was being sworn in. I don't know why I did that, but that's all other preachers older than me do that. Now, that's how you baptize somebody. So I just hold my hand up like that. I don't do that. I'm not talking against that. That's okay. But, you know, I would do that. And so I'm standing in the baptistry with this guy, and he is unchurched. I'm not sure he's seen many baptisms in his life. Maybe his is the first one. So he looks at my hand raised up like this. I'm going through my speech here. I'm now baptized, you know. And he looks at my hand. And he looks at his hand, and he looks at my hand, and suddenly I can see the light come on his eyes. And he just reaches up and he goes, slaps me a high five. <laughs> and I said, I now pronounce you baptized. <laughs> Listen to me, if you can't laugh, if you can't laugh at your own imperfections, you're gonna have a tough time in life, aren't you? You're gonna have a tough time in life. Fred Smith said this. Fred Smith said, when you suppress laughter, it goes back down and spreads to your hips. <laughs> Some of us need to laugh a little more. <laughs> would, you look at, would, you, would you look with me while Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 13? You're having too much fun here today. You know that? 
2 Corinthians 13, 11 says, aim, let's read it out loud together. Aim for perfection, live in peace, and the God of love will be with you. That's a hard balance to maintain, to aim for perfection, but to live in peace. Because you know when you have high standards, you're often discouraged and frustrated because you fail to meet that goal. But one of the ways that you can live in peace is to develop a healthy sense of humor and be able to laugh at yourself and your occasional failures, but you still give of your best to the master. And here's why. If it bears his name, it's worth our best. Amen? If it bears his name, it's worth our best. Let's stand together. Would you stand with me right now? And I want to read this final scripture from Colossians chapter 3, verses 23 and 24. Let's read it out loud together. Read it with me. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. So regardless of who you're going to report to tomorrow, regardless of who your supervisor or manager is, regardless of who signs your paycheck week in and week out, they're not your boss. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Right? And it... And if it bears his name, if it bears his name, it's worth our best. Father, thank you for this time to, to be here this morning. And, and, and we just pause right now and we say, God, with everything that we have, we want to give to you. And, and we know, God, that, that, that excellence can fluctuate and, and, and people have different standards. And, and, and really, all of us feel messed up, and we are in a lot of ways, and we don't feel excellent. And yet, God, you said, J just bring that to me. Bring the good, the bad, and the ugly. Just bring it all to me with everything. Give it to me. And I will clothe you in my righteousness. I will dress you in my excellence. I will call you child of God. And you will be an excellent offering. You will be a bride presented unblemished, without wrinkle, without stain, or without spot. I will present you to myself. And Father, we thank you for that. We can't do that on our own. We can only do that in you and through you. So, Father, I pray for anyone right now who needs to make that offering of themselves, who needs to give themselves to you. Father, may they know that you receive them. You're waiting. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.